Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Rollout. I'm Lindsay Rousseau. And I am Genevieve Marie. Hello and welcome. Yay. Okay, so we have such an exciting episode today. Two of my most favorite people in the world are here, and we are going to talk about Cruella, Disney, Disney Plus, all the amazing movies that have been coming out with two bona fide experts who have very intimate ties to the Disney World universe. Um, we have Caitlin Rubrock and Isaac Robinson Smith. Hello. Hey. So why don't you guys uh, give a you know quick introduction to let people know who you are, you know, how you come to be Disney fans and other. Uh, Caitlin, let's start with you. Well, gosh, can you be a fan out the womb? Um, just been a Disney fan my whole life. Why not? And wait, what was the rest of the question? I just blanked it. it just tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, maybe some ties that you have to the Disney world, to Disney universe, which you can possibly talk about. talk about it. Well, I'm, I'm a voice actor and I've been doing that for just about eight years now is coming up that I consider it my professional foray. And my first gigs were working on theme park audio for the different theme parks around the globe, safety spiels or little tiny characters here and there. And my first Disney show project was Amphibia. So I'm, Fel I'm Felicia Sundu, I'm Amphibia, so that's a really nice one. And of course, I, th I think most people might recognize me because right now I'm rocking the dots as Little Miss Minnie Mouse. So it's been an incredible joy, the greatest joy of my life and my career to be a part of that legacy. And I don't wanna get, break the magic too much, but it's, it's been a wonderful ride and there's lots of wonderful content on Disney Plus with new stuff for Minnie, new stuff for Mickey and the gang. So I hope everyone enjoys that. Awesome. And Isaac, you also yeah. have a lot of amazing things that you have done. <laughs> yeah, my first profession, I'm also a voice actor. Um, my first professional job in voice acting was for Walt Disney Imagineering. So like I, I have told people that I will probably be professionally connected to Disney for the rest of my life and career, which I'm not mad about at all. Um, but yeah, I've been doing voiceover for my first gig was in, I think it was 2011, 2012 with Imagineering. So, you know, about 10 years ago, I started that relationship and I've done a lot of things since then for the parks. Um, I love Disney since I was little um, and I've loved the history of Disneyland and, and all that stuff. And I mean, you know, both Lindsay and Caitlin can attest to, <laughs> you know, when I, when I lived with you, this stuff was all over the house. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, and most recently, and probably one of the most important jobs, actually, no, I've, the most important job I've done in my career so far um, is if any of you go or have gone to Avengers campus uh, in recent, like since it's been open for a couple of weeks, um, I am the official voice of uh, the Black Panther for the show in California Adventure. Um, and that was an incredible honor because at the time when I got the job, there was no one approved by Disney or Marvel to be a sound alike voice actor for Chadwick Boseman's version of Black Panther. So I'm still reeling with the fact that I got to bring like even one one thousandth of what he brought to the world mm -hmm. and to the world to hear superheroes, to, but especially to the black community. It's, you know, that there's so many things about it that I don't want to take up time, but there was a lot of stories behind like how it worked. And then, but anyway. That's my biggest tie to the company at the moment, and I'm super proud of it. So, Yay. yeah. Awesome. Well, so to be, I think we can officially say you guys are bona fide Disney experts, or yeah. as close as you're going to get. Um, yeah. So let's let's just kick off the conversation and let's talk about the latest. Well, I guess it's not the latest because Luca is out, but one of the most recent Disney movies that just dropped, which was Cruella, that dropped on Disney Plus and also in theaters. Um, obviously, this movie is based on an iconic Disney character, um, but this was a pretty different take on her. And I know a lot of people have been like, "Well, how does this actually tie into the original character?" Because there's been some changes. So I'd love to know what kind of some of your thoughts were on that. When it comes to the live action movies, um, it's like there's two subsects. One is kind of like a pretty faithful remake of a movie, like the first 101 Dalmatians live action back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And Close. they're pretty straightforward with little differences here and there, but ultimately an homage to its original. And in my opinion, these new releases since, what was our first one? 
Um, Relevant, I would say. Yeah. Like she kind of just stepped onto the stage to be like what we know now is the Disney live action trend. I know we also had Alice in Wonderland, which was a very true. true. I, I would say it starts there, but with these live action reboots, remakes, I consider them to be a Disney approved fan fiction. (laughs) <laughs> it's not related to canon. It's not taken as canon outside of the original animated feature, but it, it allows a person, a director, and a writer's vision of their idea of this story retold. Mm-hmm. And when I view it from that lens, like I can absolutely enjoy what I'm watching as someone else's fan fiction of it, remake of it, interpretation of it, without contradicting anything that came prior as canon. And Cruella had plenty of instances where you might think, well, wait a minute, if this is this, how does that tie in with this? And like, it doesn't really. You're just kind of meant to enjoy what it is in front of you. Right. If you want the canon, you got the canon. It's in your it's in your DVD case. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I, I agree with with the term the the um the terminology used, I think is very good. And I also think that it I think fan fiction is even is such a strong way to describe it. I think especially because as, you know, kids, because a lot of the stuff that's coming out is like reimagining of, you know, the Disney Renaissance, um, which is, you know, stuff, you know, I grew up with. So I think it's interesting that people that are kids are more people that are running Hollywood now or running those things. So I think like, you know, it's like we have our chance to do these versions of these stories that we love. So it's kind of like when I watched Cruella, I was like, oh, this is totally how a millennial would talk about this this story and this character with right. this medium because it's like I don't know I just loved the darkness of it I love that there was this 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 kind of sense of rawness that I haven't seen from a live action Disney movie like a lot of the time that I was watching it it didn't feel like a Disney movie and that was what I loved about it it was like this very different turn I was like this is great like I want to see more stuff in this sort of aesthetic and I don't really know what to call it I, I can't put my finger on what exactly the, the descriptor would be but it is really this movie was very unique and I loved all of it. And also, of course, visually, it's just on point. Oh my gosh. And it is so well yeah. acted. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it came to the time period in which they set it. Like they set it in the 70s. Yeah. So like, you know, obviously yeah. Maleficent is, you know, fantasy, it's futuristic, a lot of CGI, but they made a point of setting this in an era when, you know, well, I mean, obviously they use CGI in it, but it's like not distracting. It's used, you know, for no, creating yeah. the world. And so it's like, you could... It was heightened reality, but you could actually feel like, oh, this is something that actually happened in the real world, which I think to yeah. your point, Isaac, a lot of Disney films are tend to be, you know, that heightened fantasy, not really reality, yeah. whereas this one definitely felt grounded to me. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but the, the music choices were so spectacular. Oh, good. <laughs> well, that's where I heard their entire budget went to all the music licensing for that. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. The montage for Cruella, spoiler, the montage for Cruella when she's one-upping the Baroness, all of those outfits she was wearing, like the fashion designer on this show must have had a field day. Oh. Just amazing yeah. costumes, which it should be. It, yeah. yeah always been a thing about Cruella like she's a fashion designer we always see her in a little black dress with a polar bear coat this is a chance to really see the fashion yeah yeah I think what you were saying Isaac is true like like my wording of like Disney approved fan fiction but definitely like an alternate universe yeah multiverse of timelines well this is the same story but what if this happened so basically Every movie that's coming out is leading to multiverse of madness. Somehow it's all connected. <laughs> well, they've already now made the Loki tie into the multiverse. So yeah, it's like, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. It's if there's one universe out there different from this one, that then there's a million. Yeah. So everything everything works in their own universes. So it's canon, but not canon, but canon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it really the viewing pleasure is so much more heightened when you're when you're watching it through that lens. Yeah trying to pigeonhole it into like, but how does it work with my movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to. The other thing I'm wondering, and again, kind of going back to Genevieve, what you said, like, you know, kind of starting with Maleficent and even Alice in Wonder, or Alice Through the Looking Glass, Caitlin, it seems like, and maybe, Isaac, this is because the millennials and the Gen Xers are in charge of the studios now, it seems like we're getting a reimagining of a lot of these classic, like, 
tropish evil women characters and now it's like we're explaining these characters not like it's not like the evil hag anymore you know it's like okay because you know i think going back to the old days there there was maybe a slight problem with how many just like bona fide evil women were in the disney universe (laughs) and now they're giving those characters stories and substance and helping explain even if it is a fanfic version of it how these characters came to be that they're no longer just black and white evil sort of you know, so to speak. Right. They're being humanized. Right. Yeah. And it's that whole thing, like just in in acting where a villain of the story doesn't believe they're the villain. They believe that they're helping or doing something right. So I like seeing that part of it. Because by the end, I was like, oh, no, I get Cruella. No, I I see it. <laughs> like, yeah. But I was like, wait a second, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cruella is one of those characters where out of all of the Disney villains, I think she's probably one of the hardest to adapt to a live action and make sympathetic. <laughs> you know, like, like, kill puppies. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Like that is a really hard thing to get over slash right around. And I think that's why we got such a different movie and like a different type of character because the Cruella that you see in the cartoon is definitely not the one that you see Ooh. in the live action. So uh, going off of that, like, what do you guys think about like how Cruella was portrayed, like in the differences and that they took between the cartoon, the original cartoon and the movie. And then you can also touch on the actual, the other 101 Dalmatians live action that was made, I think, early nine late 90s yeah, with Glenn Close yeah. yeah yeah and that one I mean I love I love that one as well what I love about the animated one is Cruella is one of those villains where she is just straight up this is what I want this is what I do and our conflict comes from you trying to stop me from doing what's normal yes she's gonna try to skin these puppies and just that's just who she is she's a psychopath she's She's evil in that way. Like there is nothing that sparked it. That's just who she is. And then you see like other Disney villains, which they're evil at the core as well, but their actions are usually triggered by something the hero has done. And it's a reaction. Whereas Cruella is the one who has the action first and the rest of the movie is the reaction to her decision. So that makes her pretty juicy as why she's a little bit different from the other villains. It's like, she knows who she is. She knows what she wants. And nothing, there's no, there's no hook. There's no vengeance gig. It's just, I just want to make fashion. Right, right. Well, I mean, because even Maleficent gets angry because she wasn't invited to the party, so. <laughs> but she's a problematic person prior to that from the, that the three good fairies have said. Well, yes, exactly. But yeah. as you said, like, that's what makes her different from Cruella, who just, like, jumps on the scene and is like, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. Yeah. Ursula was kicked out of the kingdom. Um, God, Jafar has been stepped on his whole life by the Sultan. Like, there, there's always those little reasons. But Cruella is just, you, you get what you pay for. You, exactly what you see, that's what you get. That is an amazing observation. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. It makes, I- makes her fun, too. Like, you're, you're free from any burden. You're free from any anger or resentment that's pushing along this evil agenda. It's yeah. good to be bad. She's just like, oh, well, I am who I am. I want a puppy coat. Yeah. <laughs> cigarette thing. But of course, we won't do that. Oh, yeah, no cigarette. Yeah. Isaac, did you have any thoughts? Oh, yeah. Just I was just going to say, I think what's really fun about this version is I'm fascinated when it comes, and I know that we've seen origin stories before, but I think when it's when it's a slow burn, it's such a big payoff by the end because I love that I love seeing the the decline of, of like this seemingly like normal ish sort of sort of girl sort of woman at the beginning and then she kind of well it's interesting she kind of turns into who she becomes but you see that she's trying to suppress what she actually is kind of to Caitlin's point because like she tries to hide her hair and all that thinking that it's not natural or anything like that. Um, but I think that there's a complexity to the character that I really enjoy seeing evolve throughout the movie. Um, but there's also something really great about seeing the joy, the joy and glee that especially Glenn Close brought to bringing Corella to life in live action. That is, that's also fun. And I think it was a expert decision to have her as one of the producers on the movie. Cause I don't think there's anyone else's opinion that they should have gotten right. of what Corella story besides Glenn Close. Cause like, 
like, yeah, it was, it was so good. Um, and also visually, not even just through the acting, but also just visually with what Cruella looked like just over time, it was just really cool to, it's, it's fascinating to watch someone's like disintegration from where they start to by the end. And if they become a new person because of that, you know, so be it. But I think it's what happened with her is she became, she be, I think she became who she always was, but in a way that was really interesting to watch through this movie and through the decisions she made. And yeah. And also her, I think it was mostly highlighted with her relationship with, um, oh, what's, I, I'm, I'm so bad blanking on the, the two thieves that she's. Oh, the two thieves. I was just uh, with Jasper yeah. and. Yeah, with, yeah, with Jasper, just to see the. What was his name? <laughs> I don't remember what the other one's name yeah. is. Yeah, but to see. I love their... that relationship, yeah. Yeah, but, to, and to see that that was kind of. Horace. Yes, yes, definitely, yes. Um, to see her, her anchor relationship and friendship to Horace kind of be tested as kind of like, this is who you are, but remember wh what this was. It was, it was really, um, I don't know. It was uh, sad is, is too simple of a word, but it was just really, um, I, I felt, I felt for, for Jasper for like saying, this is my friend that I'm trying to keep a relationship with, but I, she's getting further and further away from me and I can't stop it. It was just all those dynamics going on were so cool yeah. to me. So. It definitely made that family connection to them or she cares about them. And yeah also what divides it so sharply from the original because in the original both jasper and horace are not the brightest no. they're yeah she verbally abuses them and it's it's just that classic three idiots trope what have you where they, they, they won't leave you. it's almost like an unhealthy codependency but in this one they are a family and she has she's ha she has made her mental switch as it were but she still keeps them like you two are imbeciles but you're my imbeciles right and it, it definitely made a sharp divide from her relationship with the Baroness, who is more of a Cruella type than Cruella herself, yeah. being so willing to do whatever it takes to get what she wants. And the Cruella we, we've received, like this Cruella, I don't believe she would kill 101 puppies for a coat. Right. And I don't have to, because in this version, she, the villain has become the hero. So, and, and seeing it as a separate thing, I can enjoy it all the more. I've got the version that she is. Here's here's another choice. Here's another option at the buffet. You can have that. Yes, and thank thank you for mentioning the national treasure that is Emma Thompson. Uh, oh my god, <laughs> so good! And the whole time I'm like Mrs. Potts. I know. <laughs> what a great actress to be able to do both of those. Oh right, yeah. she just nailed it. Well, and yeah. in just all of the performances in this film were just fantastic. I mean, from Emma Thompson to Horace, I mean, I just, I was blown away. I didn't feel like there was a wink, a weak link in that film at all, which, you know, most movies that come out, you're like, oh, well, this character was, eh. but this one, I was just like, I felt like everyone just nailed it. Yeah. Yeah, everybody was there. Everybody was there. Yeah. I definitely would have loved a little more with Roger because we've set Roger, yeah. mm -hmm. but didn't give him a full, spotlight to explain his point of view like yeah. we got with and anita was so lovely done as well but with roger i definitely want to see more if there is a sequel leading into a prequel sequel like godfather part two mm -hmm. <laughs> i definitely want roger to get more meat in his character so we can see him the way we see him in the animated one right i did love that that like that that end that post credit spoiler alert. Oh, <laughs> that post -credit yeah. end. When, when they did the shot of him playing and then the shot of, of London, it was just like, oh, there's there's the movie. There's the original movie. That, yeah, and then know, giving the love. puppies as yeah. gifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, that, I love that little homage with the woman walking the Afghan dog. And it's like, don't you ever wonder how people look like their pets? Yeah. 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 The, the most iconic one from the original. Right. Yes. I wanted yes. all the couple, all, all the couples with their dogs, but it's like, that's the one I remember the most. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, and I, you know, I will say the other thing I thought they did really well with this film, which has, has obviously be, become a pattern in the past 10 years, like it's improving, was um, I feel like Disney has finally embraced diversity as well. I mean, you know, they've kind of been getting there slowly, slowly, but this film, I thought they just really managed to have just such a wide smattering of people 
from all walks of life. And it just was so organic. And it just felt like, I swear that the, the, the owner of the vintage clothing store, I was like, I love you. The, oh, the, yes. They just become this crew of misfits. And I was just like, I loved how they just managed to fit all of these things in. And it was just organic. It wasn't, you know, cause some films are like, oh, they're just trying to shoehorn or, you know, put a message out there. And this one, I was like, no, they just, it just, everything worked. All the puzzle pieces fit. Yeah. And there wasn't any attention drawn to it, which I think is great. It's like, just yes. put it in. Don't like make a thing of it, but just, I, it's making a thing of it without making a thing of it, I guess, is right. what I love. In movies, where it's like, yeah, this, this is our rainbow of people, but we're not going to like, we're not going to project that as the main focal point of the scene or anything. It's just going to exist, which is how it should be with people anyway. It's just like existing right, right. Normally, along with everybody else. It was really nice. It was really lovely. Yeah. So one of the things that's obviously come out of the pandemic was the explosion of Disney plus. I mean, I know when they originally were planning to launch it, they were not expecting the subscription numbers to reach what they reached until like 10 years from now. I think like they, they surpassed what they wanted. I don't know, like 300%. It was amazing, but obviously wow. now it seems like the new standard is going to be dual release. You know, you're going to get it in theaters and you're going to get it as a, you know, a paid service on Disney plus. I mean, you guys obviously both working in the industry and in animation, how do you feel about, like, do you think that's going to have a huge impact? Do you think it's, you know, good, bad otherwise? I mean, what are your thoughts on this new model? Hmm. It feels like for Disney Plus, um, like some projects come out behind the Premier Access and some are free. And as lovely as that has been, I, I definitely wouldn't want the free material to, to not reflect the views that they're getting since there's no monetary return that they're paying for versus seeing it in a theater. So like all those views together should be a success, but if you're counting the payment, from the theater it might seem like a bomb when i don't believe that's the case so that could change where all of their feature films from all divisions you know disney studios disney animation pixar they could be released on disney plus under the paywall which would be like a discount you pay one price and if you've got a family of five that that's uh, six dollars a ticket you know so it, it works out in different ways but then also having the theater on a huge screen immersed in that world, that's what I like the most. So I'm definitely going to go back to theaters, even if I'm in the back row with my mask on. But I definitely think movies, if you can, should be viewed in the theater. But the, it's nice to have the option at home for those who can't make the theater for whatever reason. Yeah. But if they go by views, they'll see what's popular. They'll see what the people want. It can reflect in the merchandise. So if they're really open to what subscription holders have to say, it can really build it up to be even more of a success than it is. And I think they right. even started by having on the app, like, what do you want to see on Disney Plus? Right. And you can know what you want to see. And if, if enough people say the same thing, they can figure out a way to bring it out. Right. Yeah, yeah that's true. I think that there is probably that exact thing, because I remember being upset when the 1990s version of Cinderella was not out with Brandy. And I was like, come on, everybody watch that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think definitely to what Caitlin said, as someone who is a, a cinephile, the movie experience will always be my number one. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's going to, I don't know if the model will shift super hard just because not only is there the theatrical release, but there's also uh, a huge plethora of original content that I adore on Disney Plus that I watch. Like the Imagineering story was the first thing I watched and I was yeah. floored. It was so it. good. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. And like, I mean, you know, it shows that we all love like Mandalorian and, and um, WandaVision and, and Loki, all that's, I think, so all that I think will maintain the strength of the Disney plus, like just streaming stuff. I will say though, I'm curious to know what the, dis I, this is just a question I would have if, you know, if I could ask the head of the company, <laughs> but I can't, um, but I would want to know what the decision-making process is to say, what is important enough that we don't want to release it streaming because I, there's no Marvel deals except for the original shows that are on, like Black Widow's not coming to Disney Plus as a, as a streaming service, I don't believe. I don't think they're doing that with any Marvel stuff. Um, and also paid versus not paid. Like why is Mulan a pay thing, but like the Pixar stuff like Soul is not paid. Yes. Like what's, where does that, so I don't really know the answer to that, but it's just interesting that there is a discrepancy between what they believe should be paid for versus what they think, oh, we've released it for free. But, yeah. um, but 
as somebody that loves and knows about how things work and like animation and everything, I'm like, wait, <laughs> hundreds of hours, thousands <laughs> of people were involved yeah. in making this animated movie. Yeah. Everybody should pay for it. You know, like that's so soul surprised me in that way when soul came out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, obviously oh. Mulan, it didn't work well. Like the, the viewing yeah. numbers for Mulan were not great. Um, and obviously it had, a, there was a lot of problems. It was the first yeah. kind of to really do this model. It had been pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. You know, I think they pulled it from release like a week originally before it was supposed to, I mean, so there was obviously a lot of other things going on, but right. yeah. Well, it also was embroiled in multiple controversies Right. And I know that, and then, and not even the controversies like held people back from seeing it. People didn't see it because it wasn't a musical. People didn't see it because, you know, or the characters were removed and yeah. Yeah. Characters were, re characters that, you know, were beloved were removed. Um, also like historical inaccuracies everywhere, even though they said that they had an entire team working on it. And it, that, <laughs> it, it was just that was just not a good film to be their first one to like try and break the mold mm -hmm. um but I do I really would be interested um like Isaac was saying to know the numbers and like the data that they have as far as what they do release and mm -hmm. you know what they do release on um streaming for free and what makes like what makes a movie by disney you know worthy enough for that paywall to me it seems like they are doing their disney animation studios and the live action for the paywall and then somehow pixar gets kind of pushed into a bit of a corner yeah <laughs> even and though pixar has been solid on Everything Pixar has everything. been, yeah, well, Pixar has been outperforming and has been their moneymaker for a very long time, you know, since Dis even before Disney Animation Studios, um, like the actual, like, you know, drawing and animation cell studios closed and like they stopped making like actual animation that wasn't digital. So it's kind of strange to see that they're like their main powerhouse or what was their main powerhouse when they were putting out, you know, movies like Toy Story and Wally -E and all that, just to be kind of sidelined into this little space. Do you guys think that maybe it's because this, that Disney wants to give their subscribers, their loyal subscribers kind of a give me every now and then for mm -hmm. an incentive to continue to watch Disney Plus, even though they do have the Marvel TV shows, even though they do have their other TV shows and like their documentaries that they're coming out with, like maybe that's an incentive. What do you guys think? I hadn't thought of it that way before. That, that's a very good point to make. And, and that's what I was mentioning earlier about focus on views more than money return, because if you've given Luca for free, it won't have any payment from a Disney Plus paywall, and it will only rely on what has come out at the theaters. And that may not, the money spent may not accu accurately reflect the views it received and how much attention and love it can receive. And I see where people who are upset with that decision are coming from, because it's not about the money per se, if they're getting a cut of it, it's that you wanna see that something is lucrative enough to put focus and time on to continue that story if you want to do a sequel or a spin-off to explore more of that world. Because if it's a one and done, there's so much untapped potential. And I wouldn't want money to come in the way of anybody's creative outlets or untapped potential due to just who's in charge at this time, what's the what's the community like, what's our audience like. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a fine line to walk, especially when you have these big movies. Some some of these big movies they're not what you think they might be. They may do well or they may not do as well. Yeah. And it's rough because if this is a definitive view, this is one person's view on it that got approval. Who knows what this movie could have been had it been directed by these people or had these writers. So I'm all for like expansions of stories to see other people's opinions on it. And that's why that's why Mandalorian is so amazing to me because Jon Favreau, and Dave Filoni, they have this vision they may never have gotten to show if it was all strictly just George Lucas or just yeah. movie related 
with what their talents and aims are. So if we're opening ourselves up to more creative content without money as the issue, there will be so much more return that they won't expect because they're giving at voice. Exactly. Yeah. Right now, the pandemic has affected everybody. So I can see why it's like we have to pay for certain things, but maybe this can be free as a as a soother or a thank you for staying subscribed to us and not leaving. Right. Because if there's just more things that you have to pay for, yeah. like if you buy into the subscription and I don't know how much it is per month, but you keep having to do this, like, like, you know, games do the pay for play sort of thing where you can't really like advance or get better things without having to pay extra on top of the subscription that you're already paying for. It can definitely get frustrating for families, especially if you are working on a, you know, pandemic slash post pandemic budget. Yeah. One yeah. thing that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Isaac. I was just going to say, um, I think what both of you said, I think it speaks to the, I think someone at Disney or some group of people is paying attention to that dynamic because I think it speaks to just the, I think it speaks to the spirit of entertainment in general of paying versus not paying. Like for example, when you go to Disneyland um, and you go watch a show, like you watch a musical or watch, you know, an entertainment show that has no monetary return whatsoever. People aren't paying to see that, but it's an unexpected, delightful surprise. And that's why people come back and pay to get into Disneyland again, because they remember those entertainment things that you yeah. can't get anywhere else. So I think that may have been muddled for a little while because it's like, oh no, people have to pay for all these things. And people have to, you know, make sure we make a return or have a, have a physical number that says, this was successful because we made this amount of dollars on it. But there's nothing that you can monetize from saying this movie changed my life or this interaction with this character completely changed my whole career or this saved my this saved my son's you know life from you know a completely you know all these things that can't be monetized but that's the thing that has to be preeminent in Disney because that's they do so well so I think that is sort of what we're playing into it's like seeing things on Disney plus or like original content that just shows up like I didn't know I needed this but I want it now and right. it's going to give something that you can't like you can't write down a paper and saying, you know, 17 smiles today from this show that we released last week. Like, but that's the thing about Disney that's great is you get, that's that's the thing that they're known for, in my opinion. And so I'm really happy to see and hope they continue with capitalizing on that sort of mindset versus like, how much can we get that's that we can physically log in? Right. Um, because it's not what entertainment is. You can't log the experience. You can just have people remember it and tell other people to go see it. Well, that's what, makes, that's what makes Disneyland such a unique aspect of the company. And, oh, come on, Caitlin, what were you going to say? Um, like when you're paying to get into Disneyland, the money you have paid is to walk in through that gate. There's plenty of people who have paid their annual pass and they love to sit on Main Street and people watch or just absorb the atmosphere. They haven't done any rides or shows. They just love being there. So they pay to walk through the gate. What happens after that? They try to make it the best event it could possibly be. They give all these offerings. And I think the character meet and greets are such a bridge between the content you're receiving and how it makes you feel. Yeah. So right. If your child adores Donald Duck, like they're just everything duck, they gotta have it. This is a Disneyland's a place where like, look, that's Donald right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And talk to him you can hug him he is it physically in front of you this is your moment and even for us adults there's plenty of experiences at disneyland you can talk to the people or you could say this is my favorite show do the performers ever come out and meet you and sometimes they do if you can make a magic moment happen you can meet that one agva who's like you're my favorite character in this show you make me feel so many emotions, I wanna thank you. Like that stuff can happen. It's like how we wanna feel when we wanna meet a, a, a film celebrity and we get we can probably get a Twitter interaction, but it's yeah. tricky to do that stuff. But this is such a decent way to do that. Yeah. Well, and Isaac, you obviously have firsthand experience with that. I mean, you performed with the Dapper Dans, you are part of the Star Wars experience, yeah. I guess you're an Imperial officer. So like you are right there with that fan engagement yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's, there's nothing you can, yeah, that and the Fantasy Fair show, there's nothing you can replace with those sorts of moments. I mean, there's, there are many stories that I think Caitlin and I could both tell from 
mm. being cast members at the park and just yeah. irreplaceable. My the highlight of my the highlights of my theme park career, um, a lot of them come from working at the park. And you know, that's the stuff that I that's the stuff that I would return to the company for. That's why I love it. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I thought that was really interesting with Disney Plus is that, you know, they've used this and obviously some of their, their most of their marketing has gone towards their new um, Marvel shows, new Star Wars shows. We don't really have any new Disney shows. We're getting lots of feature films. And obviously, you know, you've still got the Disney Channel, Disney XD, Disney Junior, all those other things. Um, but I'm, it's, it just seems very interesting that we haven't gotten original Disney TV shows on Disney Plus yet. And I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, that just won't happen because of, you know, the cable Disney Channel shows. Yeah. But nowadays, a lot of people don't have cable subscriptions anymore. So, you know, you're missing out on Darkwing Duck and, you know, um, some of those other amazing shows that are out there. Um, it just, it, it seemed interesting to me that they're putting so much focus on the Marvel and Star Wars shows but with Disney, it's all the feature films. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I do don't know. It, do you think it might actually have to do with the age group that can actually afford to buy? Because usually I'd say that the older generations are the people that are most likely to have cable. And mm -hmm. that like my generation, like Lindsay and my generation and below us are the people that are more into buying into streaming. And so they'll probably put the more like adult quote unquote content on the streaming channels, like, you know, like Marvel, like Star Wars, like they know that that is the stuff, like we are the audience for that. So they'll put that on there. Whereas, you know, they'll put like the more like younger kid stuff on their Disney channel shows to where like, you know, the older adults with like little kids who might, you know, have, might still have cable or can actually afford cable and maybe a streaming platform here and there just because their income is greater. You know, I think that it actually has to do with age groups and a little less that has to do with, um, you know, anything else. Um, yeah. but also you're going to have to have content, you know, in order, you have to diversify your content in order to get people to, you know, make Disney plus viable, but also still keep the Disney channel viable. Like, and how do you do that? Ex exclusivity of the content. Right. It, and definitely things that premiere on Disney channel, Disney junior, Disney XD, they don't come out to Disney plus until usually a month after the last episode has aired of yeah. the season. Right. So it's definitely an incentive for parents today with little ones to have cable, to have access to that so that their kids' favorite shows are up to date. And yeah. kids will talk about it at school and you want, you want, everyone wants their child to be like right there in the conversation, able to contribute because that fosters the friendships and it hinders any bullying. So I definitely see why cable is still a thing for that. There yeah. are some shows on Disney Plus, but they're definitely audience oriented. Like it's, it may not be for all ages or like Big Shot, The Mighty Ducks, High School Musical, The Musical, The Movie, The oh, TV yeah. Show. That's true. Yeah. yeah. True. I forgot about those. Like there I was thinking, I was so focused on animation. I totally forgot about the live action TV shows. Yeah. 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 Animated, yeah. Ones, animated are definitely cable first. Yeah. And there could be any number of reasons for that. It could be something to do with SAG. It could be something to do with the Producers Guild or the Directors Guild. There's so many hands in play. There's no any answer that I could give specifically, yeah. but you see why the pattern would be that way. Yeah. When you get a lump sum on Disney Plus, you can revisit it or someone who wants to watch it but isn't like involved with it every week where it's in their face, they don't have to worry about not binging. The Loki, sh or, I'm sorry, the Marvel shows like Loki and WandaVision and Mandalorian, people are talking about it the next day. So yeah. you want to be in on the ground floor and watch it on your, watch it at midnight on Friday as if the app doesn't crash because so many people are watching it because it's right? so, yeah. so, trying to avoid spoilers is ridiculously hard. I know, you have but, to like avoid social media. It's, yeah. Yeah. But usually animated shows, those ones, 
because they have a, a specific audience of like under a certain age and then animation buffs, they, they won't spoil it as much. They won't talk about it as much. They won't make the gifts of it as much. They'll talk about it, but in the right areas and you just avoid those areas until you've seen it. So it's definitely a divide of what's all encompassing. Yeah. And I think they, I think that's why it would divide them like that. Right. Yeah. Well, also Disney, I feel, and correct me if I'm wrong, is unique in that I think they are the only streaming provider that is so diversified across all platforms. I mean, they obviously, they have three cable channels. They've got the Disney plus and they've got features. So HBO has a channel and features Peacock, a channel and features. Um, what else do we have out there? That's well, Paramount plus. Paramount plus, Paramount plus a channel and features like Disney has all the age group categories. Cause you know, HBO, it's like, okay, that's adult content, you know, NBC, you know, NBC Peacock, that's, that's kind of a wide range. Whereas Disney has everything from, you know, the four-year-olds to the 80 year olds, you know, they, I think they've really locked in that model of being able to hit every demographic in some mm -hmm. form across all their options. Right. And let's not forget that they also have, you know, other channels like ABC. So right. Wow. They're diversified across National the geographic, you know, yeah, exactly. There's something for everybody. And I love, they, they, and I just love how they are so brilliant with, I don't know how they figured out the, the nostalgia formula, but they've done it and they keep doing it. Like even for movies that are like, even for movies that I wouldn't have known about that are out there. Like I, I, until Disney plus had never seen the computer who wore tennis shoes. And I loved that movie. It was such a great uh, you know, stuff like that. I was like, wow, this is, so there's, there's a historical element to it as yeah. well for me that I love. Well, and Disney's like one of the oldest studios out there. So yeah. the catalog goes back to the 1920s. So there's no shortage of things barring projects. Disney has had a hand in, in some way that might be under contract. Right. Like there's a reason I can't remember the exact reason, but there's a reason Muppets take Manhattan is not on there. There's oh, a, wow. The Aladdin TV show is not on there. Oh yeah. There's reasons for these. And it could be like they're waiting out contract expiration. They're waiting to be able to buy the rights back from them. Like yeah. things yeah. are fully being added back in. Yeah. And I've rarely seen anything taken away. Like like, oh, it's gone now. Like like at Netflix, it could leave. And then right. maybe it'll come. Well, it's because Netflix, the only thing they own is their original productions. Everything yeah. else is contracted. Well, and that was because early when Disney Plus originally launched, some of their content was still on Netflix. So it couldn't be on Disney Plus till it was off Netflix. Yeah. They got to just wait out those contracts. And H HBO Max in particular, they are working up towards that standard that Disney Plus has. Because there are definitely a lot of Cartoon Network shows that are streaming on there. They've got a, they've got a contract with Warner Brothers. Right. So other projects right. are, are HBO Max now, rather than Warner Brothers creating Warner Bro Plus, they're tied to HBO Max. So now you've got that, right. that double studio of, of content. Yes. So it is working towards that. But uh, again, like type in on the app, like I want to see Muppets tonight. I want to see the Scarecrow of Romany Marsh, like say those things and then yeah. Disney will Hey, this is something that our viewers want. It's worth putting the money towards to break a contract, to buy them out, mm -hmm. to bring it back. Yeah. Right. It's so much good stuff that isn't on there yet, and it should yeah. be. I know. <laughs> so I'm sure is, it's coming. It's, it's, oh, I'm sure. Scary. It's yeah. So um, what are so obviously we have a, quite a few movies to look forward to that are coming out in the near future. I mean, obviously we have Black Widow, we've got, um, you know, Shang-Chi, but we also have Jungle Cruise, which, you know, I think so far the trailer looks amazing to me. Um, obviously I think they're, they're trying to capitalize on how popular Pirates of the Caribbean was and that, right. and everyone was like, wait, you're going to take a ride and turn it into a movie. Well, four, four movies later it worked. Both of you, because you were so involved with Disney, is there a ride at Disney that you're like, that should be made into a movie? Um, space Mountain. I really think that there is so much, I mean, space is just, I know space has been done and we've seen movies that are so incredible with it, but just, I don't know. I feel like there's, cause what's cool about 
that ride because i it's my favorite ride at the park it's like and now oh, rise so. of the resistance is, is tied because it's just such it's a monumental achievement in imagineering but just because space obviously is is so so infinite in its possibility of what can be told with it and the way that disney could tell a story but also i would it's my favorite ride because it's a ride that walt disney designed before the technology could catch up with him to actually do it like he had an idea for a Matterhorn in space but it never happened while he was alive mm -hmm. um and then like what's what I remember the story of the ride being is it's a space station that landed in Disneyland is the story of Space Mountain so it's like a space station that could so that space station could exist with a fleet of other space stations and maybe there's a mission that they're going to do or something but I just there's a lot of open possibility with Space Mountain, I think, in the history of why it exists or how it was built or inf infusing that with some others. So yeah, Space Mountain for me. I is, love that. We've never seen space in mountain form. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> it, uh, what I love about the rides is the rides are at their most basic. Here is one element that you're doing. You are sailing through the Caribbean and look at these pirates ransacking they can build an original story off of that and that's what made it so successful. Haunted Mansion is a little more specific in what's going on and because it's a horror genre, ghosts, Disney played it safe with the comedy. I'd love a remake of Haunted Mansion like where Guillermo del Toro had pitched it like, it doesn't have to be like R-rated super scary but make it as intense of a thriller as Pirates was. Pirates had a lot of death, it had a lot of skeletons, it had a lot of intense moments. Pro, I think PG-13, but like Haunted yeah. Mansion, I think they can push it a little more in that direction. Yeah. For, as for original, I want to see a Big Thunder Mountain movie because it's the same thing. Here's a, tr a runaway train, let's, let's find a story to build around it, and then of course your big climax is we're on a crazy train, we have to avoid dynamite, we have to avoid goats. They can make it work. Jungle, yeah. Yeah, I, Jungle Cruise, I feel, would be a success because the elements that they're passing are ride elements, but there's a story behind it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that that's what I was going to say to that is I think that that's why those rides have lasted for 60 years, 50 years, is because the audience of the riders can experience and create their own story as they're going through. Because I don't think, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I don't think since Thunder Mountain, when it came out in the 1970s, that Disney's created a ride that wasn't designed around, or Disneyland has had a ride designed around an IP. Yeah. Um, I think everything since then has been a movie that has exists or something wow. like, I mean, not like, you know, the stories from the store, like Fantasyland weren't based off of movies because that happened, but like a story where it's just like an environment that you're experiencing hasn't been done since Thunder Mountain. Because even like Indiana Jones, which is a monumental feat on its own, was still based on you yeah. know, the right. story. But so I think it'd be interesting to see if they create a ride. I mean, movies off of rides, but also create a ride that's just, here's an environment that exists and we created this really yeah. cool story that's always around it. I and will it say, lived. however, we did get the weird like decade and a half of California Adventure Park, yeah. which was not themed to Disney anything at all. And it just flopped. Yeah, and then we got well, I mean, to rebuild, and it yeah. took them forever to get their, you know, to get their feet under them with that park. But like now, everything, like you know, the pier is changed into Pixar Pier. It was Paradise Pier. You know, I think the only thing that they had for a very long time in that park that was anything Disney themed was uh, Bugs Land, and while well, we all know what happened to Bugs Land, yeah, <laughs> R.I.P. Bugs Land. Bugs Land right. enjoyed it for a long time. And it was a good that's a good IP that was aimed for kids. But it yeah. seems like a lot of the rides at California Adventure are very carnival-esque rides. Like right. the Well, they needed the space. That's why Bugs Land got kicked out. But it because there's just like the originality of these rides are too simple, like a very right. big ride. And it just simply because they're designed by people who are much different than those original Imagineers and that right. are yeah. sure that was in place for Disneyland. And that's not their fault. I don't, I don't think no. but definitely like, I don't think I need to see a movie about superstar limo. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my Lord. Uh, I think the only one that you can point to that would be any interesting would be Grizzly Peak period. That's it. Soren, I think, could have an element of it if you have a good story that's structured around, like, maybe there's a, a tour for hang gliders. Yeah. 
like you never know. Like like any idea is not a bad idea until a yeah. better idea comes along. So it right. could be for True. the future. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Well, and Disney does period very well because obviously pirate. I mean, it was fantasy, but pirates was a period piece. Jungle Cruise is a period piece. So like to your point, Caitlin, like if it's an old school train, you know, it's like, well, there's your Western, you know, it's like, and that's something they haven't done in a while. And obvious. And also it would be really interesting, Isaac, to see a space story that's not Star Wars, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, and Haunted Mansion, that opens the door for so many options. You know, if there's 999 ghosts, that's 999 stories. That's 999 episodes of original characters you could create and their their success, their rise, their fall, their death, probably. And they could probably make it very comedic in that Mark Davis way. Yeah. They end up at the mansion. Like, there's there's options that oh now i want to that sounds like a tv show then so i feel like that should be disney plus's next yeah that that's a good sound idea. like content that should go to disney channel like that because it is more adult like that sounds like a perfect show for disney plus yeah well and they're also coming out with that new show um and it's something i've been saying so it's like did they read my mind but a show where each episode is focused on a disneyland attraction i'm so excited <laughs> is perfect for the overall umbrella that's yeah. Do a show like I want to know everything about Haunted Mansion, and that's the episode, regardless of length of time. Yes, right. I'm getting what I want. <laughs> so. yeah. That's that's something else that I love is Disney will tell the story regardless of length of time. Because like if you look yes. at like Wanda Vision, it's like 36 minutes, 42 minutes, <laughs> 55 minutes. Like it doesn't like, matter. However long it takes. Yeah. yeah. No standards and well, and that's no. the, the beauty of streaming. And we're you know we've seen this, we see this on Netflix, we see this on other you know on Amazon. Like they're able to. I saw, shoot, there was some director who just gave an interview about the, oh, I guess it was the director for um, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist just gave this interview. He's like, hey, if we could have gone to Peacock, because those negotiations fell through, we could have told so many different stories, because he's like, some episodes I was just having to trim, trim, trim to get, you know, the right time, because we have to account for ads. He's like, I totally could have had episodes that were 70 minutes and some that were 40 minutes. And I think, yeah, yeah. Caitlin, that's the beauty of streaming is you're like, well, here's our budget. We're going to make all these episodes to tell this one story. So however we decide to cut it up is, you know, and they're not, they're not filming like network and cable film, which is, you know, you're usually filming as you're dropping, whereas now you're filming all at once and then releasing. So you can find the cuts you want. You don't have to worry about standards and practices for a viewing medium, as opposed to your own studio's standards right. and practices. Yeah, right. That time length, like, how many how many 20 minute tv shows or 40 minute dramas have we seen and like that felt so rushed they should have yeah. done, they should have yeah. made this two parter mm -hmm. like, oh, well these are normally 40ish minutes we're doing 50 to make sure this episode gets its due mm -hmm. well that one's only 30 that's all the time we need why add useless filler yeah so that, yeah. that creative outlet that freedom good stuff Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I think perfect. that does answer a little bit of our of our previous question about, you know, the Disney Channel versus Disney Plus as well, because um, like Caitlin said, you got to cut things for commercials. You know, you've got to add that like sweet, sweet commercial time, whereas, you know, in streaming, you, you don't have that, like unless you're, you know, on a streaming service in which like you have to kind of pay out of advertisements like but Disney do that so you know it that I think that a lot the studio a lot more freedom yeah. to you know, make what is make what they need to make in however length of time they need to make yeah. it in yeah well like in the last also, oh sorry go ahead Genevieve yeah oh I was just <laughs> I was gonna go um I was gonna go back to uh Cruella and the Disney live action films like i i i don't know how you guys feel but i feel like the disney live action films haven't they haven't really caught their stride they have they've made money but i don't think that they've had the success that disney necessarily envisioned for them do you think they're getting better because they they started off with you know alice in wonderland and uh, maleficent and you know they did they did well in the box office i know there are a lot of alice in wonderland and maleficent fans out there 
um, more so than I think there were like fans of, you know, the live action Aladdin or the live action um, Lion King. But the difference between those two is that uh, those two groups is that one of them told an original story as Caitlin, uh, as Caitlin was saying, like one of them told the fan fiction version and then the others just tried to do almost an exact retelling of the same story that you see in the cartoon. Like, do you think that Disney is getting better with their live action films or do you think that they're always going to operate a tier below what the original Disney, like the original cartoons were? I, I would say they'll always operate a tier below. And I don't mean that as an insult. It's just that the, these originals cannot be replaced and we wouldn't have a remake without that original. And it does set a, a precedence and a standard for what we're expecting with that story. So you just kind of have to hope your audience is willing to, to, to visually watch a new alternate universe fan fiction and without being super hardcore, but some people are. And I think, you know, you, you take your chances, but also with these remakes, depending on what movie you're remaking, if it's a perfect movie as is, a lot of people will want to change up the story just to see what could be different. Like, whereas Sleeping Beauty, like the focus is now Maleficent or Cruella, the focus is her backstory. Things and, and movies like Cinderella and Lion King, they are perfect just as they are. So doing a, a very closely tied re remake, it, it, it's, it's now giving you a realistic visual of it, expanding on it in certain ways changing a few things for better or for worse but like who wouldn't want to see Cinderella's transformation for the ball happening to a real person in a real dress that isn't a 2D animated color like that and that's what makes musicals so successful when musicals are based off movies yeah. it's like how would they do this or the beauty and the beast ride in Tokyo Disneyland how will they transform the beast in a in a 3D visual real way like that's the excitement that these movies can attribute and then if you have movies just to stretch your animation talent stretch out the story if it was very simplistic i'm excited for the live action robin hood when that comes out because robin hood's one of my favorite movies i think and it'll be like lion king where it's animals but they'll have will they have realistic faces will they have kind of animated faces I like the animated animals more so than like, look how real this bear is. Look how real this lion is. Like, yeah, but I want to see yeah. pretty. Yeah. It's a little yeah. bit more exciting when yeah. there's like some artistic, you know, license taken. Yeah. Just an element of unrealness in a real world. Right. Yeah. I mean, because obviously animals don't, <laughs> animals aren't anthropomorphic. So why try and get as close to reality as you can. I think that would look terrifying actually. Yep. <laughs> I like I like when it's like look who's talking. Like the the voiceover, the dogs are talking to each other but they're not moving their mouths. Yes, it's in the head. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like hey, they're they're speaking in a language we just literally can't hear. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. Isaac, did you have any thoughts? Yes. Uh I, I also agree that I think they're going to operate a tier below just because there's such a nostalgic and, and visceral connection people have to the original. But the thing that I want to see is I want to know if Disney's ever going to enter the live action era again of just making movies that are just stories that they create. Like what happened to movies like, like The Rocketeer or The Happiest Millionaire or The Absent-Minded Professor. Like those are just movies that they're making and they're a studio that makes movies, not saying let's take the safe bet on something people loved 25 years ago and just remake it like you know, if it was just an original movie that just happened to have the Disney name on it with their brand of, of entertainment, I think wow. that's when they would soar because those movies are successful and they're they're great. But like, I want to know what happened to that version of the Disney mm -hmm. live action movies because those are still live action movies, but they're not tied to anything. But like yeah. those kind of, and also there are a zillion fairy tales out there. Pick a new one that we can all love, you know, and just try try it. You know, yeah. that's what I would love to see. I feel like, like they have the brand recognition now. Like, oh, The Rocketeer is still one of my favorite movies of all time. Like yeah. when that came out, I saw it and, oh, it was so great. But yeah. uh, I, I love both of what you said. Um, I can't believe it's already been an hour. We could have so many more conversations about all of this yeah. because no, it's so fun. No. 
I know we'll do, we'll do a second episode when you know like when Jungle Cruise comes out or something we'll we'll have to do a follow-up episode yeah. to talk about that and um but yeah. you know re real quick where can people find you if they want to follow you or do, if you have anything you want to shout out um I'm pretty simple it's um Instagram is IRS voices and I'm on Facebook like I don't really have and I guess the only last thing I'll say is this is the live action remake that I want to see Ooh. I want to see it land yeah. yes. <laughs> that would be great Somebody Actually. please, somebody please watch this and, and make it that I want to see these awesome submarines in, in the Oh, that would be so cool. I want to see the other one too, like Hercules. Oh, Hercules. See Danny DeVito. They are, aren't they? So I make so. it now while Danny's still. Yeah, I know. Please. We need he's still here and alive and moving. I mean, he's uh, still good. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. He's still rocking it. So yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, he's going hard in that show. He's excellent in that <laughs> show. But Caitlin, where can people find you? Or do you have anything you want to shout out or anything? Uh, let's see. Uh, Twitter, I'm at Caitlin Robrock. Instagram, I think I'm at K Robrock. I really should have had one name for everything. I am never on Facebook. Don't even. <laughs> but uh, Instagram and Twitter for sure. And I think my DMs are open if anyone wants to slide into them. Uh, shout out. I love everybody. And Isaac's got good stuff coming, so we should watch it. <laughs> and uh, next July, the second part of Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse is out on Disney Plus, And it's very, very funny. Yay. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Very funny. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Genevieve, yeah. how can people find more amazing content like this? Well, if you want to find us, just please like this video, subscribe to our channel, ring that bell so you get notifications every time we upload a video. Uh, we go live every Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and we would love to see more of you guys. Uh, if you guys have anything that you'd like to talk about, like Cruella, Disney Plus, Disney Plus versus the Disney Channel, please drop in the comments below. We'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an excellent conversation, one that I've been wanting to have for quite a while now. Um, but yeah, we will catch you next time. Bye, guys. Bye.